Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Ian Wormsley. I have the honor of being the provost of Imperial College London, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Schrodinger Lecture. Now, this is the flagship lecture of the Faculty of Natural Sciences, and we have been fortunate over the years to have some extraordinarily distinguished speakers, uh, such as tonight's speaker, Dr. Rajiv Shah. Uh, from the past, we have had both very uh, powerful and external speakers, such as Sir Paul Nurse and Professor Stephen Hawking, and also some of our own stars, including uh, Professor Michelle Doherty and Professor Sir Martin Hera. So this is a tradition that I think speaks to the highest qualities of the college's research uh, ambitions, as well as to topics that are both timely and substantive. Now, we're joined tonight by five of our Schrodinger scholars, and they will be exhibiting their research at a session later on at the reception downstairs in the Queen's Tower Rooms. So I hope you'll take the opportunity to speak to them, learn a little bit about what they do and uh, their journeys here and their ambitions for the future. The scholarships awarded to our most outstanding PhD students in the natural sciences, and we're very grateful to those who have supported that scholarship uh, that supports in turn these very talented students. So continuing in the distinguished tradition of this lecture, we welcome tonight's speaker, 
Dr. Rajiv Shah, who is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. The foundation is a global institution with a mission to promote the well-being of humanity around the world. Dr. Shah has had a distinguished career across international aid, policy, the academy, and business. He was appointed by President Obama as the US aid administrator, uh, who, and he reshaped the agency's operations and impact in more than 70 countries across the world. He led the response, the US response to the Haiti earthquake and to the West African Ebola pandemic and has served on the National Security Council. Prior to this, he also served as the Chief Scientist and the Under Secretary for Research, Education, Economics at the United States Department of Al Agriculture and has also founded a private equity firm focused on power and infrastructure projects in Africa and Asia. He's also been a distinguished fellow in residence at Georgetown University and at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Tonight, Dr. Shah's lecture will explore how we can overcome the current economic, health, and technological divisions of our world to solve the climate crisis and protect our planet for future generations. So it's a great honor to welcome Dr. Shah here this afternoon for what I'm sure will be a very inspiring talk. Now, before I, I turn the podium over to Dr. Shah, I would like to note that after the lecture, Professor Richard Craster, the dean of the faculty, will be leading a question and answer session in which you are all very much invited to participate. After the uh, question and answer session, there will be a reception in the Queen's Tower Rooms downstairs, and people will help to guide you there, and you'll have a chance to meet one another and some of our scholars. And finally, I just wanted to note that as a college, we have been looking at our history in the context of the college's present day mission, both as an institution in itself and also in terms of the historical figures that have been associated with the college. And we're particularly interested to consider how we celebrate the contributions of various individuals to science, to the college itself, and to society in general. We're in the process of rethinking our protocols on how we name entities at the college, and we seek to align those entities with our institutional values. The Faculty of Natural Sciences has at the moment established a working group to consider, consider naming within the faculty, including this lecture, following concerns raised by our community. But now, uh, let us turn to the lecture itself. Uh, please join me in giving Dr. Shah a very warm welcome to Imperial. Dr. Shah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Provost Walmsley. We appreciate uh, those, that kind introduction and those comments about uh, the values of the school and the process you are undergoing. Uh, I'm quite honored to be here. I'm, a, I'm aware of who uh, has spoken at this particular event in the past and certainly admit I'm a bit intimidated by that list of prior speakers, including one good friend and mentor who's not with us today, Sir Gordon Conway. Um, who's an extraordinary leader that Imperial is proud to call one of its own. Uh, now, uh, my, my discussion today will focus on, on climate change and some ideas on how we can bridge some of the divides that seem to keep us from solving big global problems in the world today, challenges like COVID-19, uh, the conflicts we see obviously in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, the food and fuel crisis that that is now spawning around the world. Um, and I will focus my remarks on, on really the growing and devastating divergence that's taking place between advanced economies and developing ones. Uh, I believe fundamentally that the climate project that I suspect many of you are deeply engaged in uh, is in fact failing to take account of the needs and the aspirations and the human potential uh, 
of much of the developing world. And I think if that continues, the climate project itself will be unsuccessful at great consequence to all of us. Concepts you understand better than anyone here at Imperial College of London. Uh, this is, in fact, the right place to have tough conversations about a divided world. Uh, this is an institution with, with an extraordinary history of scholarship and service. Uh, I, we found this old photo from the autumn of 1945, just a few months after World War II was won. Uh, King George VI visited Imperial to celebrate its centenary. And it was, in fact, a new era that uh, you were all celebrating together in that moment. The war and its terror had ended, uh, but the peace was still new. A new Cold War was emerging, and the new world was uncertain. Imperial College, its scholars, its students engaged in that task from perspectives of science and diplomacy and politics and helped shape the future. And to some extent, that's what we're asking you to do again today. When you did it back in 1945, you were not alone, and they were not alone, the, those in that photo. Uh, this is a photo that was taken a few years prior with Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who met with US President Franklin Roosevelt aboard the USS Augusta. After this picture was taken, uh, they, in fact, came together and shaped something that we rely on deeply today and we've seen in action in the last several months, the Atlantic Charter. The Atlantic Charter was, in fact, a set of objectives they laid out about how to shape the post-war era in a manner that would prevent the next world war. And central to that thinking that would bind us together was, in fact, their worry about the effects of persistent fear and want. Those were the words they used, fear and want, that would lead to the kind of anger that then generates the conditions for conflict. And their concern was, of course, focused on a post-war Europe that had been decimated, but also took hold in a much larger, much more global context. And so it was after the COVID charter and the war that we created together the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, to shape a more stable globalization that would bring up those who otherwise lived without. The United States invested in a Marshall Plan here in Europe that over time uh, led to spending almost 2% of American GDP, at the time $13 billion of spending, to enact a program that of course has transformed the shape of the post-war era. And after that, still, we created institutions like USAID, which I was proud to run, and DFID, and so many others, that carried the mantle of global development, of the basic idea that if human beings everywhere could achieve a basic level of dignity, a basic living standard that gave them hope and opportunity, that we would all be safer and more secure in our global arrangements. The results of this international architecture have actually been extraordinary. From 1961 to 1970, Develop, developing countries grew faster than, uh, than developed ones. And in fact, that basic theory of convergence was the underlying concept that those institutions were created to promote. Convergence, for those of you that you remember your co college level macroeconomics courses, is, is absolutely a simple idea. It's that capital and labor come together to define a production possibilities frontier and it's, in fact, technology, knowledge, and innovation that defines how productive that capital and labor can be together. And wealthier nations are presumed to have more advanced levels of technology, and that technology is presumed, a central assumption in economics, to diffuse broadly so that countries that don't have that uh, more advanced level of technology will, in fact, catch up. And we've seen that convergence theory, that accelerated growth in developing countries relative to advanced economies take hold for much of the last 80 years. And in fact, that growth, coupled with specific initiatives and investments, despite all the noise, despite all the conflict, despite all the poor governance you've heard about, read about, and studied, 
lifted billions of people out of poverty. So much so, so much so that just a few years ago, seven years ago, we sat together and negotiated an arrangement around the Sustainable Development Goals based on the basic idea that extreme poverty could be eliminated from the face of this planet. The progress that we had witnessed over that time period took extreme poverty, the incidence of extreme poverty from roughly 40% to then 20% down to well under 10%, six to 8%, depending on how you count it. And we set the goal to get under 3%, which we were calling effectively zero when we negotiated the SDGs. But as we know, that convergence was deeply incomplete. Inequality across countries shrank dramatically, but within countries, wealthier and less wealthy, continued to expand at pace. And the theory of convergence driven by technology and innovation and know-how freely diffusing and being taken up across the world worked in some cases, but in many cases took years or decades to be realized. And in fact, I think we still see that challenge today when we look at the reality of COVID. But the, the true story is that in 2019, none of the UN's sustainable development goals established around poverty, hunger, health, education, access to energy, efforts to promote environmental sustainability to sustain our climate, none of them were on path to be met by 2030, which was the due date that was set in 2015. And then, of course, COVID hit. And in my view, COVID has been extraordinarily disruptive to the 80 years prior of convergence. In fact, COVID has ushered in, both because of the disease itself, but more importantly, the way we've responded as a globe has ushered in an era that the IMF and others call an era of great divergence. More than a year ago, the world developed an incredible set of vaccines, and I hope you all remember getting your first shot. Uh, I certainly remember mine. It was liberating in, its, uh, in the feel of that. Well, 35% of the world's population has not even had their first dose. That's true for vaccines, and this chart shows you the, the inequity in access in terms of vaccinated adults across wealthy and less wealthy nations. But it's also true in testing, treatment, all the other tools we rely on to return to a more normal economic life and standard level of social and societal activity. We also saw a fiscal response to COVID that was incredibly inequitable. In fact, in in the United States, we spent 27% of our GDP on responding to COVID. Most of it was responding to the economic consequences of COVID. Across all OECD countries, they spent more than a quarter of their GDP doing that in 2020. In developing countries, they spent 3% of GDP, and in middle-income economies, they spent 5%. The result has been, as expected, a rapid bounce back, and in some cases, uh, a push up of inflation in much of the industrial world and a stagnation in developing nations that has resulted in what a great divergence actually looks and feels like on the ground. 240 million people have been pushed back into poverty. 811 million people, about 50 million higher than the baseline, have, are hungry today. 100 million people have lost access to electricity as a result of that systemic crisis, and 54 million women have been pushed out of the workforce across uh, World Bank estimates. And, and so you can see that the economic divergence, which can now last for a decade or more, is actually going to get worse before it gets better. We are looking at a fuel crisis, a food crisis, and a debt crisis. In fact, developing countries today will expend $310 billion on debt repayment to industrial nations as opposed to the other way around when it's needed the most at home. And so here's the bad news, and I'm sorry to be bringing you so much bad news at, at one point in time, but climate change is going to accelerate that divergence. We see in study and report after report that the people who are most vulnerable both had the least to contribute in terms of emissions and have the lowest standard of living on the planet. Uh, 
Latest estimates indicate that 3.5 billion people live in highly vulnerable places, and almost all of them are in developing economies. 550 million agricultural workers and small-scale fishermen and women face significant losses as the earth warms, and 32 million more people will fall into extreme poverty. These types of impacts are much more concentrated, as you can imagine, in the developing world. In fact, the World Health Organization estimates that there'll be an additional 250,000 deaths as well from malaria, malnutrition, diarrhea, diseases that primarily cause mortality in very resource poor settings. And in that context, the global climate fight, I would argue, is actually missing the opportunity to include everybody. The conventional wisdom on how to respond to climate change has truly been both inequitable from a country's participation perspective and insufficient when there have been efforts to reach out and invest in developing and emerging economies. In fact, the Paris Agreement is based on uh, a notion and a math that is fundamentally tied to that diffusion story. It assumes that wealthy nations the, who are the biggest industrial emitters will cut their emissions quickly and get to net zero by 2050, and that ultimately allows us to envision 1.5 degrees or two degrees of warming overall. And it further assumes that we will invest in developing economies to be more or less on the same path and since those economies are much lower emitters today, uh, it's not considered as much of a problem in terms of how you actually tackle the climate crisis. We've called that analysis static math. If you look at a more dynamic assumption, and this chart is a dynamic assumption that developing economies will grow, uh, that it's, their people will be lifted up in terms of their living standards, and it models the required energy consumption to achieve that outcome. What, what you would see is, yes, in uh, OECD economies, emissions comes way down according to the Paris Plan. And yes, in China and very large middle income economies, emissions goes up and then starts to come down. But the big unaccounted for math is the 800 billion metric tons of emissions that come from 81 energy poor countries in the gray part of this graph that frankly single-handedly wipes out any chance to be under one and a half degrees or under two degrees. I've asked our internal climate scientists, this is a task for the Imperial College, to figure out what will the temperature be under different scenarios if we continue to just ignore future emissions assumptions from developing economies that are growing and that absolutely will and must lift the living standards of their people through the consumption of, of energy under different scenarios. And I, I don't know the answer. My, my colleague told me not to purport, pretend I know the number. But it's got to be over two. It's got to be over two and a half degrees. It might be higher than that. What does that, what's the difference between one and a half degrees and two and a half degrees in terms of what the world actually looks like and which parts of the world are habitable and productive in 2050. Those are the types of questions I hope you can address and answer. But one thing I do know, if we stay on our current energy path in 2050, 77% of assumptions, if all of the Paris commitments and agreements are met, if all of them are met, if we stay on our current assumptions, we will still have way more carbon emissions than anyone is expecting, and we will have 77% of those total emissions coming from 81 countries that we ignore today because we think of them as energy poor and therefore low emitters. So I, this, I believe, is the central challenge for creating a global climate fight that fundamentally includes everybody and that recognizes the need to lift up the billions of people who live in environments where they're not getting enough energy today. And so who are these folks and what does this actually mean? Well, energy access and power, which ultimately drives the preponderance of the chart you just saw previously, is in fact inequitable and unsustainable in today's global economy. Electricity use per person 
is in fact, uh, according to the Oxford Multidimensional Poverty Index, which tracks 10 different elements of well-being and uh, access to core and basic resources, it's the most cross-cutting element of those 10 indicators for whether someone is able to lift themselves out of poverty or whether they remain trapped in a state of poverty. This, of course, makes sense. Imagine what your life would be like if you consumed no electricity. You can't do it because we get out of bed, the first thing we do is check our phone, turn the light on, hopefully it's in the opposite order. But you know, it, it, we do consume energy continually in, in wealthier economies. And despite the fact that electricity was discovered 182 years ago, the basic macroeconomic concept of diffusion of access has simply not happened at scale. In 2021, 768 million people still lived completely in the dark, basically consuming less than 150 kilowatt hours per year per capita of energy. That's one light bulb, one small appliance for the course of a year. That's not even real productive energy. Others have asked, MIT has estimated that, that a proper modern energy minimum would be 1,000 kilowatt hours of consumption per capita per year. And that, in fact, if you use that statistic, means 3.6 billion people in 81 energy poor countries are living well below that modern energy minimum. And so therefore you see a chart where in Sierra Leone you have 30 kilowatt hours per capita of energy consumption and in the United States you have 12,000 kilowatt hours per capita of energy consumption. So what does this actually mean in practice? Well, if you are part of the family that is consuming so little energy in Sierra Leone, you're probably in a family of six living in a village that's hours from the capital, Freetown, and on a 30 kilowatt hour per, uh, kilowatt hour, uh, per capita consumption pattern, which is about 3% of the modern energy mi minimum. That means your kids don't get to study using light. They're using uh, kerosene or some other form of, of producing light. It means you don't have any real productive electricity that turns your labor into something that's more productive for which you can get paid. It means you live in an economy where job creation is informal and not in, in a structured formal sector. And you're literally trapped in poverty. In Nigeria, where an average consumption is just 13% of the minimum threshold, a small family living in Lagos can have a couple of lights and a couple of fans but they don't have a sustainable access to electricity that allows their community to produce the kinds of jobs and economic mobility that we all take for granted. In Colombia, a pair of grandparents can move closer to their grandchildren to have them over for dinner, to improve their quality of life. If they're, they were on the prior chart, remember, above the minimum, about 1,200 uh, kilowatt hours. And at that, you can cook using reliable natural gas. The chil your children can have a flat screen TV, a hair dryer, an iron, the kinds of appliances that are time saving and labor saving, particularly for women, and it dramatically changes your quality of life and your living standard. And then of course there's the United States, which I'm not even sure how we consume 12,000 kilowatt hours a year of energy, but it's uh, obviously the highest in the world. So to change course and to create a climate fight that is truly going to work, and truly going to be inclusive, I think we have to remember two things. The first is people everywhere want the opportunity to lift themselves up. And if you've been in the places I just described, then you know instinctively there's no amount of climate modeling <laughs> that will take that basic human urge to lift up yourself and your family from them. The second is that technology is not simply going to diffuse sufficiently on its own. And continuing to make those assumptions, whether it's for COVID vaccines or renewable energy technology, leads us down a path of failure on a global basis. So what we should really have is a truly global green energy revolution that lifts everybody across the 1,000 kilowatt hour per person per year threshold, and secondarily ensures that a very high percentage, perhaps 90% of that total energy mix ultimately is coming from renewable sources. 
That's the assumption that drives the Paris modeling for wealthier countries. That should ultimately be true everywhere. So can we get there? Well, in some places, we're well on our way. Uh, Germany, for example, has the largest share of renewable electricity in the world at 42% of their total energy mix is purely from renewable sources. In general, renewables account for 76% of total new power capacity additions in 2020, uh, which is fantastic, uh, but it still isn't taking hold in developing countries. So if you look at the first graph, you just get a sense of the world versus the 81 energy poor countries in terms of their adoption of renewable energy. And it frankly looks like every technology adoption curve I've seen in 20 years of doing global development work, whether it's about vaccines or agricultural technology or now renewable energy. And it's simply not gonna happen without a big global push and a serious new effort to make it real. Almost all new wind power is concentrated in China and OECD countries. And even when it comes to solar, some developing nations like India and Vietnam have become a destination for mega solar projects, but by and large, statistically on a global basis, it's little to no real progress. So bringing the energy revolution to the energy poor world, to these 81 countries, will require a 50 time increase in generation from wind and solar by 2040 versus today. 50 times. And we have to kind of get that level of aspiration baked into our thinking if we're going to succeed. Our research suggests that this is possible, but it will require tremendous growth and tremendous investment. If we succeed, what a green energy revolution can achieve is in fact extraordinary. This is that same graph you saw before uh, and you would notice this takes, by 2050, world carbon emissions down from something you know, around 40, between 30 and 40, down to well under 10. And most of that reduction by the time you're in 2050 is driven by the lack of serious emissions from the 81 energy poor countries today. So then you have to ask yourself, well, is it possible to achieve change at that scale. And I just wanted to call out two examples in the global development landscape that I think should give us great hope. The first is, uh, is an example from an agricultural scientist, that's Dr. Norman Borlaug, uh, who invented dwarf wheat varieties that increased wheat production three, 400 percent on farm and worked doggedly. He was a Rockefeller Foundation employee, actually our, our second longest serving employee in the history of this institution. I think he was with us for 45 years, or 44 years. I know because uh, another agricultural scientist stayed with us for 45 years because he wanted to be longer than Dr. Borlaug, and he was. Congratulations, Gary Tennyson. Uh, uh, but Norman Borlaug won appropriately the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to bring his wheat varieties and many other improved agricultural technologies all across the planet. And I remember sitting with him years ago and he would tell me, you know, the whole world believes you can just invent things and they reach the people who need them most, but that's never gonna happen. And he would share story after story of sneaking seeds in his pockets and suitcases into Pakistan, planting them, taking the finance minister of Pakistan to see the difference between what they were planting before and what he was able to achieve, see these three, 400% yield changes, and that motivated a revolution. We gave that revolution a name. We called it the Green Revolution, and Gordon Conway is perhaps the world's best scholar to study the Green Revolution from. So if any of you have a chance to be in his courses or seminars, I hope you will avail yourself of that. But that effort did, in fact, ultimately move anywhere from 800 million to a billion people off the brink of hunger and starvation in the late 60s and 70s through widespread adoption of agricultural productivity enhancing technologies. The second example is on the right. These are refugees from Somalia entering Eritrea. I love this photograph because it, uh, I noticed it because it won the National Geographic Society uh, photography competition one year. 
But the minute they got into a place where they could get connectivity, these refugees who were on foot in the middle of the night pulled out their phones and, in fact, uh, connected with their families and their communities wherever they were. And it's a reminder that, in fact, if you look at the, the data around technology adoption globally, the mobile phone industry is perhaps the biggest success story of equitable adoption of core new technology. It wasn't quite as fast as in, uh, in OECD economies, but ultimately it became even more complete in its access with all kinds of new innovations and business models. So it is possible, but it requires fundamentally rethinking the level of political will and investment we're gonna make to get there. I wanna just make the case that the technology now exists to be successful. And I, I wanna tell you one little story. This is a visit we made to Bihar, India, a village in, uh, in Bihar called Derni. And, uh, and this, we're standing with a microgrid installation that the Rockefeller team had for many years uh, experimented with and constructed you know, dozens of these in and around this community in this part of rural Bihar. And this is a very poor part of India, but it's an important uh, example because when they started building these eight to 10 years ago, the cost of delivering power from one of these installations was probably north of a dollar. By the time we started measuring it, it was like 80 plus cents a kilowatt hour. And even then, poor customers in Derny were willing to buy the power at that price because frankly, it was reliable and it was accessible and government power was maybe on for a couple hours a day or was not. Uh, ultimately, through innovation, through collaboration, through new technology, the cost came down to 23 cents a kilowatt hour when I visited. And today, in partnership with Tata Power, we're building 10,000 of these rural mini grids across the country to reach 10 million people at a target cost of power delivered of 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And what drives that cost reduction and what makes this possible is technology. It is improved battery storage that reduces the cost structure of this kind of installation. It's smart metering that can allow you to connect very low income households and very carefully charge them only for the power that they consume. It's mobile bill pay that allows customers to pay through mobile phones. It's artificial intelligence. The systems I visited were being managed from Pune, India, hundreds of miles away in a different state using AI, battery management, energy management systems. And, and the young people that I met were so enthusiastic about the next level of technology they were gonna to bring to this system. But let me just give you a sense of Derny. Uh, this video shows kind of where the mini grid plant is installed. That was a school we visited that started to get power and ran uh, night school programs for girls because they had light. The flour mill, the market, the health clinic were all receiving power from this installation. The carpenter shop was a, a place we visited and spoke to the proprietor there who said, look, I get a few hours of government power, I always have, but, uh, but the reality is I can't go buy power tools, I can't employ people if I don't know that I'm gonna have reliable, always on electricity. When this grid was installed and when he became a customer of our commercial partner who was providing that electricity, he said, now I can hire people, I've bought power tools, I've tripled the size of my business, and the data we've uh, collected surveying customers of more than 500 of these grids now across low-income rural parts of India are illustrating that in fact incomes go up 50 to 100 percent, jobs get created, customers importantly pay their electricity bills all the time because they want uh, to be a reliable customer. So these are in fact transformational technologies. It's not just solar mini grids, we're, we're now exploring Metro grids that can provide power to entire towns in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're looking at new types of hydro technologies that can protect environmental resources but be efficiently deployed in uh, rivers and riverbeds that had not previously been thought of as places that could generate electricity for these types of communities. And so based on this experience and based on the understanding that if we're going to succeed, we need to bring all of us together, at COP this year in Glasgow, we were able to launch and announce a global energy alliance for people and planet. 
And this alliance is led by a chief executive officer who's here today, Simon Harford. Simon, you might want to put your hand up that folks can see you and, and come talk to you after if, if they have uh, any, you know, the ability to be a part of this effort. It is a partnership between three philanthropies, the Rockefeller Foundation, the IKEA Foundation, and the Bezos Earth, Earth Fund, each of which have committed $500 million of, of, uh, of grant resources to this platform. But most importantly, it's a partnership of all the various multilateral development banks, development finance institutions, and the types of institutions we, that have grown out of the Bretton Woods architecture we talked about at the beginning to come together and say, let's do this together. All of us together committed more than $10 billion to this platform for the purpose of reaching a billion people with energy, reliable, renewable electricity, and moving them out of energy poverty with the goal of creating 150 million green jobs along the way and with the aspiration to reduce at least 4 billion metric tons of carbon in our first years of work. Uh, those are the goals I just, uh, I just reiterated. And I would point out a couple of things. The first is, in order to be successful, and Simon really is, is better to talk about this piece of it, our mindset is we need to absolutely support countries and have them be in the lead, developing plans, constructing programs, having the capacity to implement and exercise those programs. We do need to bring significant outside capital to the domestic resources that exist on major projects and major activities. And ultimately, we need to make sure that projects get done and get done quickly. And that's the mission at hand. And when you look at what that could mean in places that are significant but currently part of the 81 country group that I've called energy poor countries, it's extraordinary. In India, 300 million people still live in relative energy poverty. In Nigeria, 45% of their population, 90 million people, have effectively lives that are fully unelectrified. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, 85% of a country of 90 million people lives without electricity. In South Africa, a country with a 48% unemployment rate, there's an opportunity to transition from coal to clean energy and to bring the world together to get that done in South Africa in a way that creates jobs. And Simon and his team are working to do that this year. In Indonesia, Indonesia's coal fleet alone could contribute up to 10 billion tons of carbon just from one country's planned and existing coal fleet. And in fact, it's part of a larger problem where in part due to Chinese financing and in part due for other reasons, there are 112 gigawatts of new coal being designed, financed, and implemented even as we speak today. So despite the math I showed you before, next year there's gonna be more coal than this year. The year after that, there's gonna be more coal than, than next year. It's just gonna keep getting worse unless we intervene and this alliance is designed to come together and create a different path for our planet. So what will this cost? Uh, and Simon, I'm very careful, this is not the budget for the Global Energy Alliance. But what does this cost society to do, and is that feasible? Well, McKinsey and company have estimated that to achieve energy transitions that would keep our planet on one and a half degree Celsius pathway will cost $9.2 trillion per year. Now that sounds overwhelming, and it's a little bit higher, but basically consistent with other estimates from the IEA and elsewhere. But if you look deeper at the numbers, about six trillion of that is money that's going into existing fossil fuels. Today we subsidize fossil fuels in developing countries and rich countries alike. As you know, coming out of the Ukraine, in the Ukraine crisis and the Russia crisis, most nations are working overtime to figure out how they can get access to more and newer sources of fossil fuels, not less. Uh, about 3.4 trillion of that is new capital over and above uh, what's currently being invested. Of that 3.4 trillion, and there are a range of estimates, somewhere between 300 billion and 1 trillion is needed on an annual basis in fresh new capital in the 81 countries we described every year between now and 2050 to achieve success. Uh, to put that in perspective, at Copenhagen, the, at the COP in Copenhagen 12 years ago, wealthy countries agreed to commit 100 billion 
every year to help support the transition. And at the COP at Glasgow, they were still debating on whether they were even able to hit that 100 billion number 12 years later. So we have a long way to go to generate this kind of capital to achieve that outcome. But I would argue it is something that can be done. And I'll conclude with this, especially in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These types of challenges are big. They require all of us working together. And they require an exceptional amount of political will. But in the past, we have shown that we understood the threats that we were looking at. We understood the realities of the choices we faced. And we made those tough decisions together. I believe, very much so, that we can do that again. Because if we don't, we'll end up with a climate crisis and a poverty crisis that continues to be pervasive. Thank you. and inspirational. Um, but I'd like to turn to a few questions and answers. We've got a little bit of time, and it uh, been, been very nice to have some questions on the talk. Mark, I, um, ah, there you are down there. Um, do, you, do you have some Oh, we, we have questions? quite a number of questions online. I bet. I bet. We, we, don't for, we, don't, we don't have time for hundreds of questions. <laughs> no, just, no just there are so many. <laughs> I just wanted to speak to the people who are watching online, because there are many, many hundreds of them, to say, yeah that we are looking at the questions and we just don't have time to do them all. Um, I'm going to summarise a, a few in a, in a single question. Um, how optimistic can we be realistically in changing the attitudes of people, ordinary people, to achieve the goals you've outlined? Well, I, I'm actually very optimistic because I, you know, what, uh, the thing that unlocked private and public capital, political will, and resources uh, was the technology. The, you know, is it possible? Can we imagine a different future? And I don't think I could have credibly given this description and this talk even five or seven years ago. Like, this is new. This is now possible. And, uh, and I just see young people, I'm sure, at, at, uh, at, uh, right here on campus, but also at camp, college campuses across the United States and around the world, that want to figure out, how can I be a part of an effort to bring technology to bring the future to the task of solving the biggest challenges we face. You know, reaching everybody with human dignity and fighting an existential threat to our planet. So I'm, I'm optimistic we'll figure this out. Uh, I've seen us succeed on vaccines in the past, on a green revolution, on mobile phones. We just have to really think of the scale of what's necessary and build a massive movement over the next decades to achieve it. Okay, uh, are there any, um, there are people with, uh, there's a gentleman there, can you, I think a mic is on its way to you. There we go, hello, there we yeah, go. It's on. Hi, Ajay Alawalia, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned, I think it was trillions of US dollars of investment that's required in order to um, transition, as it were. But my question is more of a, um, a question around who benefits from that and where are we talking in terms of return? Who benefits from that um, investment in terms of a return? Is it, public in, is it the public through ownership or cooperatives? Is it private investment? What analysis have you done to consider who benefits from that investment, essentially, not just obviously the climate change benefits, but uh, yeah, in terms of the finances, et cetera. Sure, well, look, I think uh, the number that I believe is a real one is somewhere between 300 billion and a trillion annually that's needed in these 81 countries for this task and for this purpose. I, don't, I can't tell you how much of that should be public and how much of that should be private. I personally think this university and many others should come together and figure all that out for us. Uh, and this should, seriously, this should be a discipline of study and analysis, and there should be debate and, and you know, then ultimately knowledge creation on the path forward. But, you know, at the end of the day, who benefits? Well, customers benefit, right? The, the people that we met in Derny and all around the world benefit. Uh, certainly, the people who operate these types of private 
commercial energy producing distributed renewable systems should benefit over time. They should have a sustainable business. Right now, most of them are not, you know, they're not investable by UK or US private equity looking for 30% returns. Um, but you know, for for uh, they are sustained. They are able to generate revenue and cover their costs over time, and so we should be able to figure out how much subsidies needed to get them off the ground. The Indian projects do benefit from a per installation public subsidy that defrays the capital expenditure on the front end. And in fact, I should say, no country on the planet has achieved universal electrification. Not one without massive public subsidy. Um, certainly true, and I'm obviously from the United States, but there's no country in the world. So to, to look at relatively resource poor countries and say this should all be private is, is both ineffective and, and unrealistic given the lessons of history. Okay, Mark, can I try one, yes, one, more, on, I, one, one more online? I have a question from 13-year-old Nitesh Kashalia. She asks, he asks, um, what are, the, what are the things being done to help farmers combat climate change, particularly innovations? Uh, well, that, that's a question about agriculture, and I'm, I'm glad it's asked because I think the other, there are two, first, I think there are two big sectors in 81 resource poor nations that fundamentally affect the long-term trajectory of climate change. One is energy, the other is food and land use. And, uh, and I'm eager to understand more what the path needs to be on food and land use for that to be really productive. Um, our our f agriculture and food program, which has been active for many, many years, supports uh, different types of nutrition-oriented and sustainability-oriented agriculture. So regener regenerative farming technique that really invests in improving soil quality and carbon sequestration and food productivity and quality coming out of that. We do some work to support replacement feedstock for livestock feed. Actually, from a climate change perspective, if you look at the food system, livestock feed is probably the biggest culprit uh, to why the global food system is number two only to energy as a disruptor of the path to net zero. And uh, so we've invested in alternative proteins, insect-based uh, protein uh, as a replacement for for uh, otherwise grain-based livestock feed, which you know should be possible. Uh, I never had livestock feed myself, but I can't imagine it matters as long as you're getting them the right kind of nutrition. And so those are the kinds of areas of innovation we're we're looking at and trying to invest in. Okay, and um, one more, one more on. From I here, think maybe? I have the mic here. I, my name is. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Sasha Serafimovsky. Two quick questions. One relating to the first question and your response about the movement needed to make this happen. I saw uh, 150 million jobs created. How much of that is, is, is from here, people here who can go boots on the ground as it were, sorry to use that expression, but uh, go down there and make it happen? And how, have, you, have you actually had a look at how many people you'll need to employ locally to make it happen? And the second question, Side question is how, how what's the average temperature in the eighty two countries in the eighty one countries? Uh, well, I certainly don't know the answer to the second question, <laughs> uh, but you know, but there is a disproportionate you know uh, tropical representation of nations, so I assume it's higher than elsewhere. On the uh, on the question around where how do you break down the one hundred and fifty million jobs? I know that. I think 25 million of those in our planning and modeling assumption was related to the actual construction and uh, work required to put in place the new infrastructure that this would call for. Almost all of that is local uh, employment. And then the remainder was secondary job creation from access to energy like we saw in Derny with that carpenter creating jobs in their, in their shop. And that, of course, is also local. So I think the goal here is, and, and the reality of anything, if you look at the green revolution, the mobile phone revolution, those are all fundamentally driven by local talent, local capacity. There are some areas like new battery chemistries. Uh, there's a big issue with the global battery supply chain and where it goes and what it means for cost. There'll be areas of innovation and invention. The smart metering that we saw in India that so was such a breakthrough for those small commercial enterprises uh, was actually made outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, 
a group of innovators there. So there's always the opportunity to be part of the movement, but the bulk of job creation should absolutely be local. Okay, Mark, one, is there one time? I think we have time for one last question. You, um, you I have go, a you question. Go to the online community. Go, go. I have a question for Mira Shah from the Malavo Montpellier panel. Shah, it's a rather long question. I'm going to contract it, Mira. I hope you don't mind. Um, how can developing countries take the lead when developed countries with regard to carbon and transitions are simply not doing enough either in, terms, in their own terms or in terms of transitions or financing? Well, you know, that's a great question because we're, we shouldn't be asking developing countries to take the lead at simply reducing their emissions with no other story, opportunity, or narrative associated with it. And that's not what this is about. This is about lifting the living standards of people who live in economies where the fundamental constraint to growth is a lack of access to reliable energy that's affordably produced. And the realization that for the first time in history, it is cheaper to provide the solution to that problem through renewable technology and to do that aggressively and at scale and to do it in a way that reaches absolutely everyone. And look, the old way of doing things, building big coal plants, relying on public distribution to reach everybody, has failed these communities for 180 years. So it's probably time to try something else. And, uh, and it's just that our systems and the way financing moves and Simon could describe this at length for those later. It takes just, it's so locked into the past. These projects often take seven to 10 years to come to fruition. Uh, and so, you know, we have to look at what's out there and make the changes needed now. Okay, well, I'm going to draw this to a close and I'm going to thank you very much. Uh, it was thoughtful, inspirational, challenging, everything that we would have wanted for this talk. So thank you so much and thank you so much for asking our question. Thank you. Thanks very much. Really and uh, now I invite you all to join us in the Queen's Tower rooms where you'll see some posters from PhD students and scholars and uh, to join us for a, for a, few, a few drinks and a bit of and, uh, something hopefully to eat as well. <laughs>